So hi, everyone. And I'd like to thank you all for joining the webinar and for your participation today. This webinar is being hosted by the Stockholm Environment Institute and the Sustainable Sanitation Alliance, or SUSANA, Secretariat, as part of a grant to SEI funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This is also the second in a recurring series that we're hosting at the end of the month. The next one will be a little earlier on June 22nd, and we'll discuss psychosocial aspects of sanitation. If you would like to share your work um, or projects that you're doing, please get in touch with me. We're looking for presenters for the fall. And I'll add my email to the chat window below so that you can get in touch. We'd also like to make this webinar interactive as possible. So you can turn on your webcam during the whole webinar. Um, you can enable your settings at the top of the window. And you'll also be able to use the audio during the, uh, following the presentations to ask questions. You can also submit questions in the chat window, and I'll do my best to moderate the questions. If there are a number of people who want to ask questions, please use the uh, hands up icon at the top of the screen so I can uh, uh, take questions. You can also introduce yourself and the organization you're working with in the chat window below so that we get to know who is joining today. So now on to the topic for today. So today we're going to be hearing from two speakers at WaterAid and they're going to be presenting their interesting work on collaborative monitoring. First we'll hear from Elisa Dehove, Policy, Offer, Policy Officer in Monitoring and Accountability. And after that we'll hear from Ellen Greggio, Program Advisor in Monitoring and Mapping. So thank you both for joining us today and now we'll move on to your slides. Great, thanks Sarah. Okay, go ahead. Here, I'm Elisa and this is Ellen. Ellen. Um, so thank you, Sarah and uh, Dana and the Institute for uh, allowing us to present something about uh, monitoring and especially on collaborative monitoring. Um, so we'll be giving a brief introduction about what we perceive monitoring and collaborative monitoring. And um, then we'll give you example of collaborative monitoring that we work on. So I'll be presenting about what and Ellen will be talking about what are perspective and work on collaborative monitoring. So I'm going to move on to the first slide. Um, first, I would like to just talk about why are, why are we monitoring. So um, we've seen three main points about monitoring. And the first one is about monitoring to support evidence-based decision making. This is probably the most important point. Um, because the data that are collected through monitoring help answer the key question, are we making progress, what have we learned, and how we act on it. Um, so this learning can then feed decision making and um, review of strategies. The second point is about monitoring that allows, um, or the third point, comparison. So how is my country, region doing compared to others? It's a slightly less or more informal points that I wanted to make, but we've observed that comparing country results in tracking progress um, is a very good incentive for political leadership. Countries and service providers don't like to be worse than other countries. Um, a third point is about, or the second one here, is about um, monitoring as key to increase accountability. So the question is, is my service provider meeting its promises? Um, accountability is a big reason for monitoring today. Um, I think that the whole goal 16, no, I think the whole goal 16 is, uh, of the SDGs is dedicated to social accountability and to improve public services and develop stronger and more inclusive institutions. So when we're talking about accountability, I think we need to be a little bit careful. And on my side, I think it's more um, a it's about a confrontation of the users and of um, the government or the service provider. It's about a collaboration. And um, accountability is about setting efficient feedback loops, basically. Uh, it requires motivated governments. It requires an understanding and to align on the priorities of those governments. And um, then the data collection that is collaborative can feed into um, nourishing these priorities and understanding what are the priorities. So it's about the collaboration. And then you can keep your government and your promises to account. So 
I want also to talk about what we see as collaborative monitoring. So, um, it's about the, the transparency. If my government is not able to hide results, then we have more efficient way of knowing what is the true picture of the progress made in the sector. It's also about inclusion. We believe that if everyone is capable of sharing their understanding of the progress made in the sector, then you have a better understanding of the needs and it's less it's, it is easier to show and reflect the needs of those who are more mar marginalized. And a third one is about being able to coordinate our efforts and to harmonize data collection so that we get better data and the data that are available are of better quality and more representative. So these are like mainly the main point about collaborative monitoring. And um, we also want to uh, share some insight about what we are currently monitoring uh, in the wash sector at the different levels. So who's monitoring what? Um, it's a quite, um, the monitoring landscape is quite, not complicated, but it's, it has a lot of actors and a lot of different levels. Um, I think Ellen is more familiar with the program and country level, whereas I'm more familiar with the regional and the international, as you can see here. And I don't know, I think it might be quite interesting to have um, a little vote in the room if in the chat maybe you want to if in the chat you want to share um, what is the point that you don't know about, I've seen that we have very different kind of um, users in this in this webinar. I see Rick Johnson or uh, people from UNICEF that are actually working on those uh, monitoring mechanism, and we have also service providers and um, people from different NGOs. So I don't know if there is any question you would like to have more specific highlights maybe in the chat you can tell me uh, which, part of the, which part of the monitoring um, landscape you would like to have more information if we do not have any question maybe we can pick up like uh, afterwards uh, but basically uh, I would say that the program levels or different actors that are monitoring their everyday work um, toward their own objectives. But then also at the country level, uh, national water and sanitation monitoring and, and uh, evaluation uh, mechanism exists, uh, whereas it is to uh, monitor the finance, the budget, the infrastructures, and also local governments sometimes when there is decentralization are taking part in this monitoring. At the regional level, uh, there are many also uh, systems or mechanisms in place. Uh, for example, we put here MCAO. MCAO um, is monitoring the regional commitments uh, towards sanitation, for example, in Africa. Uh, with the African uh, the African conference, I guess the latest declaration that was tabled in the African was called the Engo Declaration, and it has a few commitments with indicators that are measuring progress, regional progress towards sanitation. And at the international level, the Joint Monitoring Program and the GLAS are two monitoring systems that are um, the main ones, I would say, that are going also to monitor the SDGs uh, to our water, so the global goal uh, num number six. Um, Fiona Goa, who works for the GLASS report, once told me to explain to me what is the difference between the GLASS and GMP, and I think it's a great uh, metaphor. If Usain Bolt is running um, 100 meters in eight seconds, Let's say that the eight seconds is the result. And this is what JMP, the Joint Monitoring Program, presents. They monitor where they're tracking progress in water and sanitation, the end result. While the GLASS is measuring, collecting data on the enabling environments. What did Usain Bolt eat before? What kind of training did he 
uh, follow. So that I think is a good analogy to understand what our GMP and glass report doing. There are other mechanisms like the sanitation and waterfall who was uh, inviting countries to table commitments uh, at the national level so that they were country specific. Um, but um, they're changing a little bit their format so we don't really know yet if um, the sanitation and waterfall secretariat and partners are going to invite country to table all their commitments next year. But they're also developing behavior that also have indicators that will be measured in the post-2015 agenda. So it'd be interesting to also keep an eye on those, all the uh, monitoring mechanisms. I don't know if you had anything. And I don't, I'm looking if there is any questions, but maybe we can do later. OK. So this was like a little bit of an overview of, um, of the monitoring landscape or framework uh, in general in the wash sector. And I would like to talk about WashWatch a little bit in detail. So WashWatch is a global monitoring platform. It's an online platform. And uh, it was really created to enhance collaboration toward um, committing, uh, tracking progress in water and sanitation and hygiene. Um, so it has two main objectives. Uh, one is to follow up on country and donors' watch commitments and progress. So what we're trying to do is to collect all commitments that a country tabled in the wash sector and to keep track of the progress made. And another objective of wash watch is to increase transparency and accessibility of wash-related information, which has less to do about collaborative monitoring. So I'm going to focus more on the first part. So um, a little bit about why WashWatch was created. Um, WashWatch is an independent platform. We didn't want it to be labeled so that all actors in the sector could be invited to share their tracking of the progress, their point of view about the progress made by their service providers. So it is financed. It's uh, financed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It is administered by WaterAid UK, but we are not affiliated with any of our organization, and it really is about uh, being an open platform, platform for collaboration and sharing knowledge. Also, it was created to be a link between the national, the regional, and the global level of monitoring. So we're not monitoring anything ourselves. We're just like putting all this monitoring system in one place, mechanism in one place, and keeping an eye on them and inviting everyone to do so with us. And finally, um, some, um, some countries already have this platform in place at the country level. I'm just going to share with you an interesting uh, example. Um, I don't know if we have it here. I don't have. Um, but there is the Buhari meter, for example, in Nigeria. Area, and they set it so that all the targets and promises that the government and the president tabled would be monitored on this online platform. And it has five water and sanitation commitments that are tracked on that platform. And um, so it's a great way for collaborative monitoring that is already conducted at the national level. But these are a very rare example, and there are not a lot of countries who have those kind of platforms. So WashWatch was created to a little bit complement in absence of national monitoring tracking framework um, when it did not exist. Um, so this is what WashWatch looks like. That's the landing page. Um, the most important part is the see and compare section that you can see on the left. You can type any country, and uh, it opens into um, this page. So this is the Ghana example. And you land on the declaration and commitment. You can see that you have here a national, regional, and global level declaration. So for example, the SWA commitment I was talking about earlier. And the regional ones, uh, so the NGO 2015 is the latest declaration of the, um, ET, uh, of the Af African process. And they're currently developing indicators. This is why it's in red at the moment, because we don't have clear indicators yet. But they're being developed. 
and the global level are the MDGs results, the right to water and sanitation, and the SDGs. Um, when a user click on one of the declarations, this is what it looks like. So you're going to see all the commitments that are related to that declaration. And on the lower box that says evidence, um, this is where all the knowledge that is shared at the local level um, and national level will be shared. So it looks like that. It opens like a pop-up window. And you can see here contribution that has been shared by and water poverty by the coalition of NGOs and water and sanitation in Ghana. And this allows, this is like the main point about collaborative monitoring, is that by collecting sources and evidence, evidence from different sources, um, it allows for triangulation of data and knowledge and to get a full picture of the progress. We encourage, like we don't do it ourselves, the, mm, collaborative use of the data. This is like the next step of Walshwatch, is what do you do with the knowledge that is gathered on the platform? And this is for our partners. For example, EWP is a great partner for that. They help us transform the knowledge that is gathered on Walshwatch and use it into advocacy material to, uh, to then influence decision makers. So this is really like what it is about. It's about using evidence for decision making and triangulation of data. Um, this is the second part about Wash Wash I just want to share with you quickly. It's about the transparency and accessibility of Wash related information. There are three tabs on the country prof on the country page and the second tab is about country profile where we gather information about sector coordination mechanism, but also government policies and strategies and wash sector monitoring. Um, these are the key documents. They are the latest up to date. And um, I'm going to show you the third tab of wash watch of every country pro um, page on wash watch is the statistics. They gather all the wash related statistics that that we can have. The latest one that we're going to be having pretty soon is the unit cost of water um, that Guy Hutton um, share, with, share with us today. But it's about health, it's about aid flows, it's about uh, education, access in schools. So, and they are the latest up to date. We update them every six months. So just wanted to share that with you as it could be interesting maybe in your work. So unfortunately, I think that uh, Mohammed from the MC, M, uh, the, just, just going to look at my notes, sorry. Uh, Mohammed was supposed to uh, come present uh, a use of Walshwatch data into, um, into his work, but I think the data connection on the inter like, is not good, the internet is not good enough. So, um, Sarah, is that okay if I just present for him? Sorry, I'm yeah. putting you in. I have my yeah. mic off, but go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So I'm just going to present for him, I think, because I don't think that uh, Mohammed is here. I can't see him in the in the chat. So Mohammed Bumbida is from the Muslim Family Consulting Services and he's used Walsh Watch and um, to feed into a report that they've developed uh, for national advocacy with the help of End Water Poverty. So this is basically what the report looks like. Um, so it feeds into like statistics. So they use, I'm just going to read my notes because this is what he told me to say in case he didn't, he was not able to join us. So um, they use Watch Watch um, to develop this advocacy material. Um, and he wanted to present how the, how the report was developed, how it was used, and um, what was the impact of that report. So regarding the development of that report, they use Watch Watch statistics, the policies that were gathered, and the commitments that did a sum up of where the countries were making the best progress and the least progress. But they also um, conducted some local research and um, work with local engineers and traditional leaders to collect data at the local level, because Walshworth does not 
share so much local and subnational level data because we don't have access to them. Um, but they did that research, and it was apparently very difficult for him to access local government knowledge and data as they didn't want to share them. Um, but they finally managed and were able to like show um, what they wanted to show in the report. Regarding the dissemination, uh, they shared the report with many local and national local um, with national level NGOs in Ghana. They also used the regional um, network of CSO that is called Conewas in Ghana, and they managed to present their findings also to Parliament members because of wherever they were living, they were con contacting their parliament members that um, listened to uh, the result and finding of uh, that report. They also tracked uh, government uh, leaders, uh, local government leaders, and um, shared the main findings of the report. Regarding the impact, um, Mohammed thinks that there was two main impacts, is that by accessing this data, the local level data, they were able to show the disparities, the real disparities between urban and rural settings, and that the level of access that were shared at the national level were not so true and were not reflecting those disparities between rural and urban. Um, so that was the triggering point that, according to him, helped uh, some political leadership on the matter and to mobilize actors um, in rural settings. And so um, before the, the report, a lot of uh, service providers that were operating in the urban settings were not operating in the rural settings. And um, the report has, has changed that. And he gave the example of this company called, called Zoom Lion. Um, that started operating at the rural uh, level and um, to work more with users to hear their feedback and to improve systems. So that was his example of using Northwatch data um, to mobilize leadership and to trigger reaction and highlight problems that um, that never have never been shown before. Um, if anyone has any question, I can maybe answer to them later on. But as a matter of time, maybe it's better if I give you the floor. Yeah, we do have a few questions, Lisa, but maybe we'll just wait to the end and then try and get to all of them. Easiest. Perfect. Um, so I was just, I would like, so for those who have joined a bit later, I think I've seen a few extra names coming in just when we were start, after we had started. Um, I'm Ellen Gurdjieff from WaterAid, and I'll just, uh, I work in the program support unit, so supporting our country programs um, across um, Africa and Asia. Um, and I would like to introduce the approach that WaterAid's programs have taken in terms of collaboration when talking about strengthening the actual wash monitoring processes. Um, so it's about the approach and also just uh, some quick um, notes on what we have identified as potential processes and tools that can support um, collaboration in the monitoring. Right, so um, just a link from to the introduction um, at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, we recognize this uh, monitoring as an essential building block for ensuring the sustainability of WASH services in the long term um, and for the achievement of the SDG 6, uh, of course. Um, as part of this, uh, monitoring and data is of need to different actors in the sector. Governments and other service providers do need regular information on the water and sanitation services to inform, uh, the, uh, inform their, um, their planning and services management uh, in order to ensure the services are improved, uh, are increased, and in order to overall increase the sector performance. Service users and civil society groups do need data to be able to hold the, provi the service providers into account and also call for improved access and services when these are lacking or weak. So already by identifying these two actors, we are already talking about collaboration in monitoring. Um, so the approach uh, that we've taken uh, in our work in the programs uh, where we look at strengthening monitoring systems is really around strengthening those the, monitoring system which are institutional and therefore are sub-national or national level monitoring processes. 
and also looking at how we can support the coordination and the harmonization of different monitoring initiatives. As we talked before, there is a very vast, um, busy uh, space in monitoring uh, in WASH. Uh, there's many different initiatives ongoing, so we believe that the coordination and harmonization is an essential point. So how do we do this? Um, well, since 2000, the early 2000s, so Water Aid has been working with uh, local governments and national governments to identify and address the gaps and, blo and blockages of the institutional water and sanitation services uh, information flow and also the use of the information for planning, um, for planning. So the actual cycle that is presented here in the slides represents the cycle of monitoring. And uh, really, Water Aid has supported in, in um, some of the local governments in identifying the correct indicators um, on data collection processes uh, and data analysis, um, data updating, um, data use, and also the uh, assessment of the monitoring, really identifying if what the process that we is being undertaken is sufficient to gather the right information. And all of this has to be done, uh, it's been recognized that it has to be done in a coordinated manner, in a collaborative way with all the sector stakeholders. And there's two key areas that are highlighted here in the graph. Uh, one is around data updating and data use. Those are two key areas that have generally been identified as the blockages or gaps, uh, or some of the challenges area for having a regular monitoring of water and sanitation services. So those are key areas that we're looking at addressing together with other sector stakeholders, obviously. So as I was mentioning, uh, through these processes, we work, uh, we uh, emphasize the need to work uh, with all the other WASH sector stakeholders and identify this. And this cover um, and range from institutional um, stakeholders, such as the Ministry of Water, Health, Education, and Finance at national level, but also at the local government staff. So those local governments that represent the Ministry of Water, Health, and Education at the local level. Uh, we work with different service providers, so if it's not the government or utilities, for example, which are mostly commonly more in urban areas. Um, sector organizations, so NGOs such as us, and all the others that are working in uh, the regions where we work as well. And importantly, also the private sector uh, that has a role, in particular when we're talking about sanitation monitoring, um, and also community-based organizations. Uh, and most importantly as well, how citizens are involved in the whole cycle of monitoring as well. Um, so um, the way we approach this is also about supporting the sector coordination and harmonization uh, through monitoring. So it's around harmonizing the data that's been collected by the different actors. It's about harmonizing the information flow that is happening from different stakeholders. Um, and this is really to try and reduce duplication uh, and increase the actual harmonization and uh, alignment of the different monitoring initiatives that are happening around WASH. Uh, and also recognizing that uh, often NGOs and donors, uh, NGOs including us, uh, Water Aid, uh, we do have some reporting and data collection cycles that do not always align with the institutional monitoring. So that's another area to think about. So what's been the approach that we've undertaken as Water Aid programs? Um, we have been working on water and sanitation mapping as an approach for regular data collection, uh, which can come from local government staff, or service provider staff, it can be derived from NGOs in the field, it can be from citizens and SEOs, or also other uh, actors such as we were saying, private sector as well. So it's about regular data collection, it's about citizens reporting on water and sanitation services. And really this information feeds into the flow of data collection, data analysis, which can be done with different tools. Uh, we are uh, completely unbiased with what tools to use. Uh, we do su you know, support the use of what existing tools are already present in the local government, in the national government. And when there is a gap, then we can introduce something. But um, it's important to understand what existing tools are already in place uh, before introducing or rather than introducing new ones. After that, um, obviously, we emphasize the need to produce uh, actual information uh, in a way that can be used by the planners at local level and national level. So it could be, for example, a map as presented here, which can highlight uh, some areas where there is a priority for work for water or sanitation. It can be graphs that are easy, more easily read by local uh, planners. So this is just an example of our approach. And really, what water and sanitation mapping uh, can um, derived from water sanitation mapping, we can derive a distribution of what the water and sanitation uh, facilities um, is in a specific area. So this allows 
For example, as you can see in a map, it identifies what the coverage of uh, water and sanitation services is in different areas and identify where there is a gap here and therefore address those who are marginalized communities and improve targeting those when implementing new services or when providing maintenance of these services, so really addressing equity of WASH services. Um, furthermore, we can uh, identify and analyze data around sustainability, so really identifying what the issues around service levels are and um, present this in different methods. It doesn't have to be a map, it can be a graph as well. <laughs> These are just examples of some of our outputs. Um, so an example of how this uh, process has led uh, to the development of a national monitoring process for water and sanitation. This is an example from Malawi where WaterAid has worked very closely with um, our one strong partners, which is Engineers Without Border Canada, who have led um, the last part of this process. Um, this is really looking at how the introduction of water point mapping, uh, which was introduced in 2002, as a process to really address the lack of information on wash services available in the ground and an uncoordinated interventions that are happening, were happening in the ground. So too many stakeholders implementing new services without really understanding what had to be prioritized, what were the targets of new services had to be, or the maintenance of services. So in 2002, um, WaterAid had uh, piloted the water point mapping in a specific region. This process really led to developing a proof of concept of how this could work to actually provide evidence and data on that could inform local planners and other sector stakeholders uh, in their implementation of WASH services. So uh, through an iterative process that went from 2002 to 2010 and is still ongoing, um, and with a really strong role of Engineers Without Borders, actually our partner, um, and WaterAid in the coordinating the different sector stakeholders um, in the country, but in particular the Ministry of Water and Health, um, this has led to development uh, of a national institutional uh, monitoring and evaluation process, which is called Rural Water Supply and Sanitation and Mini System, which allows for um, regular data to be collected on water and sanitation uh, services at community level. So we're not going to the point level, that's why the map on the left doesn't show the points. Uh, so it's about community level information. Uh, it's actually a paper-based system. Uh, it allows for regular data collection because uh, it uses the existing uh, information from, from health extension workers. Data has been collected and shared uh, between ministers. So the water ministers uh, receive information on the water and sanitation services through the uh, information flow of the health sector. So this is just an example of how mapping has led to the development of a regular data collection. Okay, next. So previously we have highlighted that data updating is actually one of the key challenges in the water and sanitation sector. Um, many initiatives look at inventories of water points, do baselines, but uh, it is actually quite rare that there is a regular data updating as the one we were just talking now about Malawi. Um, it's an area that many organizations are looking at. Uh, many tools have been introduced in the sector, but um, what we, the way, the approach we take in addressing this, uh, WaterAid is really trying to identify what, what methods can work where and identify how they can compl complement each other. So this is really is an opportunity for collaboration. There are many ways and tools that can help in doing data collection, doing regular updating of information. Um, so here we just uh, presented a list of uh, the four key um, methodolo methodologies and responsibilities for data updating, so enumerators, for example, so regular surveys that are sent out by the ministers through enumerators, respondents, meaning um, health extension workers, for example, which are already working in the community, um, or community volunteers on health volunteers that can provide some of the information on water and sanitation. Another key element is around users and crowdsourcing. So how can users and any citizen report on their water and sanitation services? This is something that many initiatives try to emphasize more and increase more. There is an important element of this that we need to consider is that uh, any kind of information that comes from users has to have a response from a service provider, otherwise it's just data that goes in the air and no one picks up on it and responds to it. So the actual accountability to respond to this is an important key area when looking at users or crowdsourcing wash data. Another one center, which is taking its uh, different organizations are testing, piloting. Uh, generally, this is not um, 
it's not yet been proven at scale. There are some several pilots on this, and the sensors generally are quite expensive um, to maintain on the long term, but it's an area that it's developing at the moment. So really try to identify as part of collaborative monitoring how can these different methods really support the gap and address the gap of data, regular data on water sanitation, which is needed by the service provider and also by the citizen to respond to the gaps. Um, so just last uh, slide, um, it's around what we have identified as processes and tools that support collaborative monitoring. So this is just a really high level uh, slide on a few of these. Um, we can discuss more demo in details. Um, in terms of processes, uh, as we talked before, it's uh, the role of monitoring harmonization. So indicators and data reconciliation, harmonization, it's very important, making sure that um, similar indicators with the similar definition or same definitions are used by different organization in the ground and the local government. Time frames for monitoring. Uh, we've seen in Malawi having the health uh, using the health in, uh, information flow can help gathering regular data for water and sanitation as well. Um, data sharing processes, what are the, those uh, opportunities for actually in, in, um, increasing the data sharing and between organizations, between lo the local governments, uh, to ensure that information is available to all. Um, another key element is around sector meetings. So how can different meetings that are happening at national level, such as the joint sector review, which is really an initiative that supports sharing from different uh, sector stakeholders around uh, data and status of WASH services. Um, at local level, there are general, there are often there are some planning discussion and budget reviewing at local district governments with communities. These are opportunities for improving collaborative monitoring and where we can take advantage of this to actually in, uh, increase uh, collaborative monitoring processes. In terms of tools, uh, which everybody is always interested in hearing more, um, there are obviously we are in 2016, the world is developing, there are many ICTs that have been introduced um, and everybody tries to jump on any opportunity for a great tool. Uh, so, but we need to consider, as I said before, the, um, so there are different tools in the sector. We need to understand what works where um, as well. Um, we are quite keen in, like, we understand the benefits of open access tools. Um, we use one for our internal uh, project monitoring and long-term uh, project sustainability monitoring, uh, which is MWater, um, but there are many others in the sectors. The open access tools are free and accessible to all, so great uh, additions to monitoring framework and the availability of tools. They allow data collection, analysis, and sharing, so it does improve um, collaboration. It can really help um, support collaboration of different organizations and also crowdsourcing from citizens. Um, and it also allows for regular data to be collected and updated, so also maintaining longitudinal data. So let's look at what's out there and take advantage of the right ones in the right place. Um, there are other um, other important op um, uh, platforms for data access uh, and also sharing and harmonization. One example for the water sector, so not sanitation unfortunately for the moment, is the water point data exchange which looks at uh, having a set uh, type of indicators across different organizations and really um, emphasize uh, the importance of data availability and sharing uh, through this platform. Um, then another element that we're looking at uh, at SportRaid is around data interoperability between different tools. As we were saying before, different tools are present uh, in the sector. How can we make them talk to each other? How can we make data easily transfer between tools and databases? So these are really the key areas of processing tools. Um, I'm done with my presentation. Um, yeah, welcome any questions. Uh, again, this was just quite high level. Um, yeah. We can provide more information later after the webinar if needed. Great. Thank you very much, Lisa, Ellen, and then Mohammed as well for your presentations. It was very interesting, and I'm sure that there's, there's lots of questions. I'm going to now turn on the mic rights for all of the people who are participating, so you're welcome to join in the discussion. And I'll also start, I collected some of the questions uh, throughout the presentation, so I can start with... Uh, one of those, you might have touched on it already, but uh, the first question was how can community-based monitoring data best be collected and summarized and then aggregated and delivered to the national level? 
yeah, that's for me. <laughs> well, there isn't one best way for sure, but um, I think it depends in each country. There are different systems that are present for allowing uh, data to be aggregated from community level to village sub uh, sub district to district level. Uh, there are different systems that are being implemented by the government, by local government, uh, national or local, uh, to facilitate this. Um, otherwise, if this is not in place, this is this is an area that we need to work on. We need to help local governments understand that communities are willing to share information and provide that regular update of information. So there is a need to, for a process to be in place to make sure that this information is available to all. The case in Malawi we were talking about was a paper-based data collection from the communities that goes up to local governments who then are responsible for aggregating the information up to the district and then um, up to the national level. So there are if we talk about tools, there are many tools that can be used for data collection um, and aggregation. If we're talking about the processes, which I think is more important here, it's how do we create uh, clear roles and responsibility, clear budgets in place for actually allowing this regular data that can come voluntarily from communities up to local governments at national government level. Great. So I want to encourage anyone, uh, you have your mics can be used now, so if you want to join in the discussion, you're welcome to turn on your video, your audio, um, to interact more with the speakers. Um, is there anyone who wants to, I can hear some sound, is that a question? Maybe you can use the raise your hand icon at the top um, just to let me know that you have a question so it's a bit easier to take the questions. Um, we did have another question about whether uh, wash watch Wash watch data, um, how people are using it um, and whether they're using it in their monitoring and evaluation and maybe that's something where there's more information um, on the, the platform itself. But. So um, it's more about people using Wash watch to conduct um, policy or advocacy campaigns. It's a resource. It's getting the data that are collected on the Wash watch platform to um, then conduct advocacy campaigns or to inform decision making. Um, it's for people to do the monitoring in the first place and then we report it on Wash Watch. Wash Watch does not do the monitoring itself. Like so all the commitments that we are sharing on the declaration and commitments um, tag, tab for example are already existing um, monitoring framework. We don't invent any of them and we don't do the monitoring ourselves. We just invite people to share their knowledge about it and to share um, uh, what are their perspective about mon monitoring those commitments. But the official ones that are shared are the official commitments and tracking mechanisms that are already set in place. I don't know if that answered the question. We have a couple of questions now about how the tool, these tools can be used in emergency uh, scenarios or areas. I'm not sure exactly if that's referring to disaster situations. And then also, how long has Wash Watch been active? What are the goals for the coming year? I'm going to answer the last one. Um, Wash Watch was firstly created in 2010, but the platform was really um, active as of September 2014 was the review of the platform online and only 50, like there was a person that was working on Wash Watch but was only 50% and I'm the first person that works 100% on Wash Watch. So it's a growing tool and the information are available on Wash Watch are not full, all countries don't have full profiles but it's a work in progress and the more data are shared with us the more we're going to have a full platform. But um, yeah, it's 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 growing. Great. But um, do you want to answer the question about there was one about on the humanitarian use? Yeah. So there are different tools that uh, can support or have been developed uh, for the humanitarian um, needs okay. and settings. Um, what we are. What the approach I was talking about is more about long-term institutional monitoring systems that obviously can support when the humanitarian setting happens, like when there is an emergency, being able to rely on an existing inventory of water point um, is essential. So um, 
it's not about how to use them. It's about uh, ensure if we uh, if we are sure that institutional monitoring and regular data is being collected in a country that allows also in situations of emergency to actually access that information. Um, there's been um, cases uh, we've read recently on the news where um, in Syria there had to be a whole new mapping of water points in, um, when, because that, was, that information was not available because everybody was connected with the network and uh, there was no information anymore on what was the public water points accessibility. So a whole mapping was done very rapidly, uh, but it did help uh, improving wash, uh, well, water access in that emergency situation. Um, so um, ensuring that uh, a database and a regular data collection is available, that helps in settings of humanitarian settings. There are other systems and tools that can be used in humanitarian settings that are more related to quick and fast response. Uh, but here we were talking more about institutional and long-term uh, watch services. Great. Um, there is a question here about if whether individuals who have undertaken water supply and sanitation have, have individuals undertaken monitoring, or is this a job that governments and NGOs do? So is there an aspect of sort of citizen science or um, that people can get involved themselves? Yes, there is an aspect of citizen science. Uh, when we talked about data updating, one of the key actor that can contribute, it's uh, users, it's citizens reporting on this information. Um, there's been some cases where we looked at the water aid at some of this. It's quite still early stage uh, in terms of there's not that many initiatives uh, at the moment around crowdsourcing information, but there have been a few. And from those, we actually have learned the really important need for response of service provider. So yes, there is a, an element of citizens uh, role in contributing to monitoring, but that has to come hand in hand with the service provider monitoring and interest in the data and response to the data that is being collected by citizens. So that's really a key area. Um, there's been one example in Uganda uh, on mobile uh, SMS-based uh, citizens reporting on non-functionality of water points and how you know, that information was aggregated at the district level uh, to inform on which water points were not functional at the time. This is just one of the cases that one um, program that we've been look, looking at recently, in the last few years. Um, and there's also been, a, we have recently finalized a research um, on which I can share with whoever's interested, looking at how different ICT initiatives can support or not, or where are the challenges uh, and the gaps of how uh, citizens and general um, use of ICT by uh, general regular service providers uh, monitoring uh, responsible can actually support in improving monitoring. So really looking at what factors allow for ICT uh, and citizens reporting to really improve service level and their, well, service monitoring and therefore also the response uh, from service providers. Great. And um, maybe we can open it up for the participants. If you, I think, uh, Lisa, you had a question you wanted to uh, post to the group. Maybe we could get some responses from uh, people attending here on, on their views. But I, did you want to um, pose your, your poll I mean, question? It will be very interesting to, to hear about your perspective, like in the chat box, or you can like put your microphone to hear about your experience about collaborative monitoring, if you have experienced yourself. And also, like we're keen on listening about, about what are the challenges? Because for the Wolfwatch platform, for example, like one of the questions was, what are the goals for the platform in the next years? Uh, we're facing a lot of challenges, for example, with what is next? What do we do with the data? It's really hard for us sometimes to, to, um, to triangulate the data that exists and get them to the next step to, to, to feed into decision making. And this is really what we're trying to do at the moment. Um, for example, we're working in Kenya with the we're working in Kenya with the Ministry of Health to really set um, systems for responding to what people put on Wolf Watch so that it's not a dead end. So this is our challenges, and it's really difficult. And we're really happy to hear what kind of accountability mechanism you know that works, and um, those kind of things would be very interesting. Also, can I answer to Rick Johnson's question? Um, Watch Watch also, like, I did not present that functionality, but we're talking about comparing, how comparing data from countries can be quite mobilizing and um, 
trigger political leadership. So there is a function in Washwash where you can uh, compare the progress made on the comparable commitments. For example, for African commitments, you can compare those progress by country. So there is a function. Maybe I could share a PowerPoint about how to do those kind of things. Um, but you can extract those data by putting them on your website. If you want, there's a little icon on the corner of like this. And it means that you can extract the data and implement them on your website, embed them on your website. So that would be a one way of, um, as you say, download the data. Unfortunately, we don't have like a download data function, something that we're investigating um, in the future. Though. Wrap up the official uh, part of the webinar for today. So again, I want to thank Elisa, Ellen, and Mohammed. Um, for their presentation. It was really interesting. I want to thank everyone for attending today. And as I said, we're starting a monthly webinar series on Susanna. So um, be sure to check it out every month and also to present your own work. If you'd like to do that, you can get in touch with me. Um, so I hope you learned something new. And since we didn't have time to get to all of the questions, I know there were some I probably missed in the chat window. I'll be posting more of those on the Susanna forum so we can continue this discussion if you have other things you want to ask Elisa, Ellen, Mohammed, or if you want to share your own perspectives, which we'd really like to hear from everyone who was, who was in the presentation today, then I, I invite you to move over to the forum afterwards and we can continue the discussion then. So once again, thanks everyone for joining and we're going to be turning off the, uh, the webinar recording now. Um, if you have any little comments or final um, things you'd like to add informally, you can stay on the line. Um, we'll be online for a few more minutes, but um, thanks again for joining.